All right. Thank you, Pimo. Thank you, everybody. And please come sit sit up close and tight because you'll be in the shot here and it'll look like we have a really big crowd. And that'd be <laughs> awesome. All right. And we'll give uh, you the way, money can, on the way out. <laughs> by the way, can we get questions from people watching the stream? Like, can you, t you know, text in the comments? And if you get any questions, we'll, we'll take those. I'll try to do it. Yes. Um, sorry. Um, I didn't realize. But Sean Flynn's going to give a little intro into Tech Code because they've been kind enough to give us the space. And he's a wonderful guy. So uh, I yeah, sorry to interrupt everyone. Yeah. I know you already no, no. started. Just make it exciting and interesting. Yeah. Um, so a little bit about Tech Code. Uh, we have currently we're opening up our 16th location, uh, tour North America, but most of our presence is in China. So for the startups that are ready to go overseas for that warm land and soft land, and we make introductions, that's one of our value adds. Uh, but we'd like to thank uh, Pamo for uh, the event tonight, and like to thank everyone for coming here. Uh, please, if you'd like to get involved with Tech Code at all, we're always looking for more mentors. If you know any startups from your network or that, please make introductions to us. Um, that's basically all I wanted to say, and thank you guys again for coming here tonight. All right, thank you very much, thank you. and thank you for hosting. I appreciate that. All right, so let's. Uh, I'm going to make the, the the introduction super quick. Uh, my name is David Spark. I am the founder of Spark Media Solutions. We are a content marketing firm specifically for B2B technology companies. And I've been doing a lot of these uh, panels. And I noticed this says f uh, FinTech here. Is this a FinTech event or a Pitch Perfect event? Perfect. It's a Pitch Perfect. That's just advertisement for FinTech Silicon Valley. The big banner that's right as you walk in. <laughs> is that, you don't know what you put up? All right, so I, 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 I thought it was a Pitch Perfect event, and then I saw that. Okay, so this is a Pitch Perfect event. Um, so we are going to talk about um, VC challenges, and what do you know? We have three great VCs right here. I'm going to make quick introductions. Uh, on the far left, that is Clint Corver, who is a partner with Ulu Ventures. Mm -hmm. I pronounced that yeah, correctly, yes. And then next to him is Susan Mason, who's a managing partner with Allied Partners. She was on a previous discussion that we had, and she was great. And then uh, Pocket Sun, who I also just uh, met, is a co-founder and managing partner at SoGal. So they are all VCs in sort of different realms, and they will talk specifically about their unique challenges that they have. Um, and I should also mention this is an open discussion from the beginning. So it's not one of these things where we talk and you wait till the last 15 minutes to speak up. If you have a question, pipe up. I'm going to actually hand you this microphone just so people on the stream can hear you as well. So I'm going to start. I always like to start with the title of the session, and that is VC Challenges. So anyone can speak up, or actually all three of you should speak up on this. And that is very open-ended. What are the challenges that you as a VC have? But more importantly, I will skew this and say that you don't think many startups are aware of. OK. I'll jump right in. Um, so I think one of the challenges that I see with a lot of startups that come to visit us is that they tend to be burning too much cash relative to the risk mitigation and the risk reduction they have accomplished for that cash. And, uh, and I think part of the, is we've come through a phase of time where cash, particularly seed cash, was relatively cheap and available. Uh, you look at the size of seed rounds, they're significantly larger than what might have been uh, 10 years ago. And um, <clears throat> I don't think the risk mitigation in the business model is sufficiently uh, being focused on relative to the total amount of cash that these companies are burning. So I would, I would say that that is the biggest challenge that I see with the startups coming to see us is how much risk have they taken out of the model relative to how much cash they've burned? Let me just add quickly, how much of it can they actually calculate at when they're, you're dealing with them at seed stage? Can they calculate much of it? They can, because I think part of what the challenge that they're doing is they get false positives in the market on market product validation, and they start to scale ahead of uh, really getting thorough validation of that. And once you start to scale a company in sales and marketing, that is a very expensive stage of the company. So it's far better to hold back on that scaling and really be sure that those, uh, those positives are true and not false positives. And so I think it's just, it's just that focus on the details of the business model that make a lot of difference in how you're going to develop your company.
pieces of hardware, you're probably going to have to burn more cash uh, up front because you're developing a hardware company. So the business right. model around hardware-based companies is going to be more expensive by its nature. God help you if you've got a semiconductor company. Um, <laughs> But software companies, you should be able to do that very capital efficient to get that initial validation points out in the marketplace before you start to scale. What about services? Uh, services, actually, you can get a lot of customer funding along those lines um, is what we've seen. So we actually see services companies being more capital efficient. Now, you don't get the multiples on typical services companies. So you know my sweet spot is SaaS software enterprise focus companies. All right, um, Hockey? I think as a seed stage investor, we always feel that we are taking a test now and waiting for the test result in 10 years, which is, I think, is a difficult scenario for any test taker. And for us, we face that risk all the time. Um, it's pretty much impossible for us to know the outcome of our investment no matter how good they look right now. And they might you know, run into some hardships around, along the way, but maybe they will end up great, but maybe they could die along the way. So I think this uncertainty is both the beauty and the struggle um, of the venture capital industry. And as a female fund manager who is running our first fund, we actually face a lot of problems that female entrepreneurs also face, and maybe even worse. Um, because in the asset management industry, which is $71 trillion, actually only 1.1% of the, the money is managed by women or minority-owned firms. So when we go out and fundraise, we face a lot of the same scenarios where uh, you know, our female entrepreneurs would face when they go out to raise money from VCs. So I think we are really on the same boat with our portfolio founders, and that really give us an advantage to bond and resonate with our founders. seed stage investor in the enterprise space. So most of the entrepreneurs that we're talking to are trying to you know, build something that's reasonably complicated, selling into a relatively complicated scenario into an enterprise. And a lot of times the story we get is we've got this great idea, and if only we had some funding, boy, we could go get some customers. And really from my point of view, if only you had some customers, it would be much easier to fund you. And so this, this I think, is a real typical, if you will, challenge. And from my point of view, the entrepreneurs that I think have done a very effective job addressing that, they find some other way to come up with validation in the marketplace without actually having, you know, a signed customer, if you will. And, you know, this can be like really easy stuff where, okay, you know, I've done this little marketing exercise and I've got 100 enterprise customers that have all said, send me more information. All right, it's not a signed customer, but it's actually, you know, it's better market validation than I've talked to a few folks and they say they're interested. And then you go all the way down, and we've had a couple of our customers, or of our uh, entrepreneurs, that have actually sold consulting projects to big enterprises. And the consulting project was exactly what their product would do, but they were just doing it manually. And the really clever ones made it look like software. And in the back, they were doing the consult. So they actually, from the customer's point of view, they were buying software. But in reality, it was just a web, you know, like a, you know, a website. And then, the, and basically, what they would say is, you know, we were doing these reports for you. You asked me what I want, and the very next morning, I will send it to you. So, so I think that's where, where entrepreneurs, from my point of view, um, basically, there are things you can do at that early stage. It's like, how do you go get market validation without actually having the capital or the resources to go get a signed customer? So, do you think in all of these cases that the the startups are aware, like, so all three of you came at this from completely different angles. So do you think that they're aware of this issue? Yes, or they are aware, and they're just pushing through anyways, or yes, they're aware, and they're very much acknowledging the problem and going after it? But, uh, you know, I don't know how much awareness is there. Um, because I think the narrative in the valley is burn hot and go hard. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you don't see a lot of narrative around, let's be a little more careful with the cash and make sure we got validation. I don't hear a lot of big time VCs talking that language, um, so. Well, you know what, you never see that. It's interesting you say that because you never see that story. You yeah. never see the story of the people carefully planned and then succeeded, yes. but the ones that like went out like crazy. Right. Because that's a more exciting story. It's a more exciting story and it's a sexy narrative. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Um, so what can startup people do to make themselves more attractive to you as you're dealing with your struggles? Like, if I'm a startup and I'm looking for investment from you, but I'm not ready to pitch you for money, but I want to build a relationship with you and help you out that would hopefully pay me dividends in the end, what's a good way to make that approach? I think what you just described is a great approach. You always present yourself in a way that you're not just directly asking for something. You are, you know, you want to build a relationship. I think VCs always buy into that. Um, we want to start a relationship with the entrepreneurs earlier um, in their journey, so we don't, we're not the last one to know when they're raising a round, right? You, by the way, does anyone actually do that? I think so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I also feel that you know startups. Um, about the cash burn, right? So actually 10 of our new portfolio companies are all revenue generating. Mm -hmm. So I feel that different regions um, have very different startup funding culture. Mm. So a lot of our portfolio companies are based in New York and Asia, for example. And the New York companies have extremely high like market valu validation compared to what their prices are. Mm -hmm. Like recently we're investing in this company that's generating like 6 million in revenue this year. And we're investing at a 5.5 .5 pre. Mm -hmm. That's like insane. Um, and some other companies that we're seeing around the valley, on the other hand, they have they had hadn't had anything, but they had raised like 10 million or even 50 million in some cases, mm -hmm. um, with no real like traction yet. Right. So, I mean, uh, what what can I'll, I'll just throw it to you both, Clint and Susan. What uh, what do you think startups can do to essentially make your lives easier yeah. instead of it? Because I always feel that this conversation with the the VCs and the startups is very one sided. Of you know, you want money from me, you know what what can you show me that makes me interested enough to then invest in you? Is there more to the story, more to the conversation that I can do to? facilitate this process. Yeah, well, so, and for me, and this might be a personality thing, which is um, if you can move the conversation from you're trying to sell me on your company to, you know, we're collaboratively working on helping you build a company. That, that to me, is a, is a more fun place to be. Wait, be specific about that. So how would I go about doing that? Give me an example of how I would do that. Yeah, so, um, like, one really concrete example would be, you know, so selling me is I figured this out and let me prove it to you. And then collaborative would be, you know, I've got some really interesting data points, but I'm not sure if this really does it for validating the market, right? So you sort of invite more of a question. As a, and, and matter of fact, um, one of the questions I really like when entrepreneurs ask me, and sometimes I'll even coach them on this, is it's like, what would I need to accomplish for you to be excited about a next meeting? And a matter of fact, I help my entrepreneurs out a lot in raising their Series A funding, and so we'll go... At, that's what actually one of the ways I coach my entrepreneurs. Like, okay, you know, we're building a relationship early. And, you know, in the, in the enterprise space, the Series A, they say you need a million dollars ARR. That's a pretty typical kind of benchmark. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like if you can validate that, right? So if you go into, like, you know, you want to go into, I don't know, a Sequoia or Greylock or one of these top tier firms, and their number is really two million, not a million. By the way, I don't know if that's true, but just as a hypothesis, right? If you can know that up front, now when you come back to them, you can come back to them in a much smarter way. So if you do your research, essentially background research to help you and to help you know, me as a startup, that will benefit both of us, and this is where the collaborative comes in. Yeah, so I think the takeoff on that is know who you are talking to. Spend the time to go to the website, look at the companies they funded, talk to some of their entrepreneurs. and you're not going to do a shotgun approach to your fundraising anyway. You're going to do a rifle shot, right? You're going to say, oh, my company is like XYZ company. Who funded that company? Let me, Because they're going to have the knowledge base of how to make a company successful in that segment that they already exited. So who did that and what can I learn from them? And so do the research before you go in the door because the last thing you want to do is have a mismatch on either market target or type of company. Spend the, spend the effort to look at that. And uh, so, here, let me, uh, let me switch gears, and this is something very specific to you, Pocket, and that you said when you got into this game, you, you were dealing with, going back to VC challenges, you're dealing with a lot of the same challenges that female entrepreneurs are having, but you're doing, dealing with it as a female VC. 
So what are the unique female VC challenges? So we all know that there aren't a lot of women partners in the... By the way, the I also know that you are a female VC. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she's the one who brought it up. So that's yes. like, but I want you to answer it too. <laughs> so I recently started a community in Singapore um, called SheVC, and it's supposed to be a community for women investors because I figured there are so few of us, and mm -hmm. we should really collaborate and share deal flow information and all that. So what I found out is a lot of these friends of mine who are you know, partners or VPs and principals at these firms, they're not happy. And they have a really, really hard time trying to push deal through. Mm. And I've heard from female entrepreneurs side too where you know, the female partner at the VC firm were really excited about her company, but then a male partner would come in and then the, the deal is just shut down. So I think as someone who like started uh, our own firm, I think our challenge is mostly in the beginning, like to prove that we have the ability, to prove that even as outliers, we have great possibility to so make great returns. Explain to me how, especially when you're young, not just physically young, but your company's young, how do you prove that you have capability? So it's really similar to what an entrepreneur would do. We built an MP. MVP. So we started investing about 20 months ago uh, because we had no investment experience really. So we started making a lot of small investments so that we can learn across the board about different um, negotiation um, on terms and you know how to really um, like how the deal is closed and how we can lead syndicate with other investors so that we can you know write a bigger check and. A lot of these things we learned by doing. So then how did you, by learn by doing, how did that, you then express that to the market so you had your credibility and everyone said, okay, she's legitimate, we can go with her now. So I think what we've or done. Are you still doing that? Well, I mean, you it's a constant struggle because yeah. we just look very different from the typical VC and because we represent the next generation and we feel that entrepreneurs are getting younger and younger. Um, and the world is changing faster and faster. So I think we have a really unique value proposition in that we understand the target consumers of most companies, which is the millennials, and we represent that. Um, so we've heard founders told us that you know there's no technical knowledge or financial knowledge can replace the understanding of the customers. And I think that's what we really bring to the table. Um, and so, so far we've made 40 investments already in the past 20 months, really. So we've been just moving really, really fast to learn about everything. We are crazy hustlers. So I, th I think our founders definitely see that in us. So we are like their favorite investors and they tell that to everyone. And it's really great uh, when we pitch to LPs. feel about you being a favorite? Well, I think <laughs> people all have different things to prove, right? And some people, they you know, they would fight the entrepreneur to be on the board, to push. Would you put up with that if you invest in one of her companies and their <laughs> company said that she was her favorite investor? I, I love co-investors that are hustlers. That sounds good. <laughs> I'd love to invest, co -invest with you. <laughs> yeah, so we just go all out to help. All right. Susan, do you feel that there is any unique challenge that you have as a female VC? Uh, so, so I've been in venture a little over 20 years. And my partner is also a venture capitalist, obviously, female. And she's been in the industry over 17 years in the venture capital as a GP. So, um, uh, so I think from our perspective, it's much more about putting points on the board. And so it's the entire strategy of how you put together your portfolio so that you could get early validation on, on returns. And um, whether that's realized returns or incremental returns. So it's really getting that balance so that you can, as quickly as possible, get the points on the board so you can validate yourself. So whether that's using your own capital, uh, which is one mechanism, and then rolling those investments into the fund itself as a way to validate that, uh, or doing rolling closes on your fund and investing in companies and uh, with the theory that they are going to be showing uh, progress through subsequent rounds, that you can show validation of your process and your business model. There, I wanna, there's a whole series of issues we, we talked about prior that I want to just kind of hammer through, and one of them being just finding talent. And I know 
this is not unique to startups uh, and VCs. Uh, so what are ways that you're attacking this problem? You think differently or like, heck, we're all attacking it the same way? Well, I, so I guess when you say talent as in um, entrepreneurs. employees, entrepreneurs. Right. employees yes, for yeah. the entrepreneurial, because I mean, because I mean, there, there's a huge amount of talent in terms of entrepreneurs starting companies, right? So the, so the challenge is, okay, I'm an entrepreneur starting a company and I need to hire six, you know, full stack engineers. Where do they come from? And I guess in my mind, that's starting to become a more important, not starting, it's, it's, a, it, it's a pretty important criteria in terms of whether we invest in an entrepreneur, which is, do they have a credible story on how they're going to go find talent? And have they been able to demonstrate that by the co-founders they pulled together or other people they pulled into the team? And, and you know, I, I've had a couple of my entrepreneurs, and I'm sort of, by the way, back in the day I was an entrepreneur and I had an outsourced development team in China and it was a real challenge and so forth. And so, so I had kind of a skeptical view of outsourced engineering. Not so much anymore. So let me, though, add to this. Have any of you actually invested in a company solely because you said, I'm not that excited about this idea, but oh my God, these are the most talented people I've ever seen, and I could literally sell them as a bunch, because I know that has happened in the past. Has any of you actually made those kind of investments? So, so I'd say yes, and it's been a mistake. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So you, were, you because you weren't able to sell the group. Well, you know, I mean, I, I guess, and, and, and this kind of gets back to our strategy as a company. I mean, so we're in this category. We're, we're looking for outliers. So those companies that can, you know, return our fund, they can be like, you know, billion-dollar kinds of companies. I mean, we're here in Silicon Valley, and, you know, there's a lot of these. And our goal is in our fund of 50 companies, we need one of them. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're optimizing for. And I guess I've got a theory, you know, is it the team or is it the op opportunity? And I'm more on the opportunity side, actually, than the team side. But have you ever had a situation where you've moved a team from one project to another, or no? If uh, Susan, uh, I would also throw that called out. a pivot? Is yeah. that <laughs> No, but I mean, usually companies don't pivot to a completely different project within a VC. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, it's an option, you know, right. especially like what you were describing, Pocket, or, no, sorry, I'm sorry, you were, I'm sorry, it was Clint or you, Susan, that described, oh. like, look at, uh, look at what, uh, they're investing in it. Was it you, Parker, who mentioned this? With well, looking well, at, well, looking well, at what companies they're investing in. Because if you go with a, a VC that's investing in a lot of similar com companies and, you know, you develop the right portfolio, right, right. then, you know, there's a lot of lateral moves that could happen here. Yes? yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, certainly, VCs are, are not above themselves of uh, having a great team in a so-so space and seeing another space with dollar signs on it and redirecting those teams to that space. Um, so certainly we've seen that in the industry uh, in the past. Uh, but I, I think... But none of you have done this yet. No, because, well, not for our model. First of all, we don't do seed and, and pivots are very difficult to do on the type of business model capital efficiency we, they, we do. And we tend to work with experienced entrepreneurs and their teams, so they bring their whole team when they come and we back them. Uh, so it's a little bit different than having to recruit a lot of folks into the company necessarily. Um, so it's a little bit, I think it's a different business model from that standpoint. And you were saying, Clint, that you are not so against outsourcing, and the reason just because this is a way to solve an immediate problem, or is there more to it? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, hiring engineering talent in the Valley has become so difficult and so expensive. And if you can find a clever way to have an engineering team in the Philippines or Croatia or some of these... Or Ohio. Or Ohio. <laughs> good point, good point. And, you know, and I, I've seen those be very successful now. And uh, there, there's, it's a higher bar in terms of the management skill you need to make those work. But when you can make those work, it can really be an accelerator to a company. And, and I'll just, I'm sorry, just quickly tell you, a client of mine, a company called Nearsoft out of Mexico, they are a completely outsourced organization. and They work exclusively with American companies. They don't work actually with any Mexican companies at all. And they just got sold because they've been growing like crazy and outsourcing. Mm -hmm. yeah. sorry, also, I think the tools that enable uh, more productive outsourcing and management of those outsourced resources has come to a sophistication level that you don't have the, the huge failures that right. we used to have. So to your question about whether we would invest in the good people but not a good idea, I think it's very important to us that they're solving the right problems. Um, so 
our fund invests in how the next generation is going to live, work, and stay healthy. So if what they're doing doesn't fit our thesis, we really couldn't invest. And also the reason behind it is I think if a company wants to be successful, there are a lot of external factors that are pushing them forward. And sometimes the timing, the market are very, very important and it's beyond just the team. Um, and to your talent question, because SoGal started as a global community for female entrepreneurs, we are now reaching 50,000 women around the world who are at either in tech or in entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial. So we actually become a huge talent pool for our portfolio companies who want to recruit especially diverse um, talent. Um, and I see more and more teams are going global with their tech outsourcing, and I think it's it's great when you can you know do it and manage it. And I think technology has made it very possible and doable um, to lower your costs like that. Yeah. But certainly, aqua hires are back. I mean, that is something that's a, a, a active activity in the valley. But uh, it just, but you none of you have done that. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, Pocket, you brought up this question about the importance of design uh, for startup growth. Uh, explain why that is so critical, and maybe is, do you think that a lot of startups don't realize that, and that's why this is a problem? Uh, depends on what kind of the uh, startup it is, right? So because we focus on the next generation consumers and as them as customers and as decision makers in their like professional fields, uh, we feel that if your product is consumer facing and you don't have good design, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Because most of your startups are going to be facing the young women who are you know, really appearance focused when, they, uh, when it comes to a product. So I think if something is not you know, pretty, it doesn't make you feel pleasant, then what drives you to go back to that app or you know, a website or the, the, the experience you have with a startup. So, so when we look at the deck, and if, if it's a consumer-facing startup and they have a terrible-looking deck, it, that's a really terrible indicator of what their aesthetics is. And I think it will be a huge deal-breaker um, when they go out to the market. Um, and for SaaS companies and more like you know, B2B-focused companies, I think we are less strict <laughs> about what their designs are. Uh, I think functionality comes before the design, but I also think design is not just visual, right? Design is a way of problem solving. Design is a way of how you approach the problem. So I think when you have good designs, that means you've done a lot of customer research. That means you really understand the problem that you're trying to solve, and you know the best way to communicate to your customers and present information in a certain way that's easy to understand. Can you describe, can you describe a product deck you saw from a startup who pitched you, you're like, oh, they get design. What, I mean, and I know it's hard to verbally, but do your best. So all of our 10 new investments have really great designs. Um, so I'm talking about the product, excuse me, the deck that you saw initially from when they pitched you. So I think good decks have really like clear and consistent color themes that fit what they're trying to do. And every slide will have, you know, very like a very straightforward, um, easy to read message that could like we could get the message within like a second. Mm -hmm. um, and then you are more interested to actually read the entire slide and feel, you know, you are like leaning towards it almost. But when you look at a very, you know, plain or not so well designed deck, I think it really affects how you feel about this company. Because I think design actually drives people into your brand, your messaging. So we really care about it, and we think design dri drives customer happiness, and then ha happiness drives loyalty, and I think loyalty is super hard to get these days. That is true. So anything add to add to the design sort of challenge, Susan? Um, so I, I think whether you're an enterprise company or a consumer company, design is important. And um, uh, I don't do I don't invest in consumer companies, so I don't have that personal touchstone. But in enterprise companies, um, it's around the efficiency of use, and it's around the um, clarity of the messaging and the usage. And uh, and so it may not be around, gee, I like purple instead of green, 
but um, it is much more around the functionality, as you indicated. But you still have to have nice packaging around it. You know, nobody wants to interact with something that's kind of old-fashioned. My, my favorite design example is Amazon. I wouldn't exactly call that beautiful, but boy, did that work. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting you mentioned years and years ago, it just goes back a long time, I did a research project for HP, and I was just asking people about um, buying online. And this is very early days of, uh, of online commerce. And when they mentioned Amazon, it was like this moment of, oh, if everything could just be as, like, Amazon. Like, they the really, one click. the one, <laughs> if I could, actually, I think it was before they had launched one click. They just, there was just an adoration to it's making my life easier. And I think that's, people have a, an affinity for that. Mm -hmm. Something that, Clint, that you had brought up uh, earlier, and I know this is a problem that I have with my own business, is trying to chew off more than you can handle and focusing on the prize. And this has got to definitely be a challenge. So how do you keep your company's focus and not going in 20 directions? Because I'm sure there's a lot of attractive brass rings around that will make it look at, as, if, as if they're accomplishing something, but not going towards the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Well, I think so, so, so first, in terms of context, I'd say there's limited tools that I have to make my companies do anything. <laughs> 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 and, and, and I tell them that. It's like, hey, look, you know, you're doing this 24-7. You know, I show up once a week or once a month, something like that. And so, so I, by the way, I've seen lots of companies, so I might have a helpful perspective. But you're going to know your company so much better than I am that you're going to have to take everything I say with a grain of salt. And by the way, so the, the one circumstance where that's different is when you're running out of money. Now all of a sudden what I say is going to matter more. <laughs> 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 all right. But so let's, let's say they're not running out of money. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's say they're not running out of money. So, so a lot of I, I try to come at it from a more of a Socratic point of view in the sense of, it's like, okay, you know, what, are you, what do you need to accomplish to get your next round of funding? So what are your fundable milestones? All right, so by the way, that's not always the kind of the guiding light, but that's like a nice organizing principle. And let's say the, for the Series A, they need a million in ARR, and they need two marquee customers that have signed up. Let's say those are the milestones. It's like, so, so now every, essentially, brass ring that comes along, the question is going to be, how does that help you achieve a million in ARR or two marquee customers? And, you know, if they don't, I'm not going to say don't do it, but, you know, it's kind of implicit in the question, like, why are you doing this if it's not achieving the two goals that you said were most important? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the interesting thing about creating value in startups is it's not a linear function. Creating value in startups is a step function. And if you don't make that next step, it's very painful on both valuation as well as even the ability to get finance, per se. So I think that's one thing that entrepreneurs think is, oh, well, if I do this, yeah, I won't be as steep a curve on value creation. I'll actually be a little flatter. And the reality is you may not make that next step because it is that step function. I would say most of our portfolio companies are pretty focused, but we are facing this problem with one company who has this successful product, but they are also R&Ding for their next product. And from our point of view, we think it's too soon. Um, we think, you know, there's room for more market traction and even better revenue and all that to establish themselves as the leader in this space. Mm -hmm. But in, you know, board meetings, other investors are pushing them to branch out into other products um, that they could manufacture. So yeah, that's a, that's a fight that we're currently battling. But I feel like VCs have this illusion that we could control companies. I, I feel that we really can't control that much. So. Well, let me give you a concrete example. We've got one company we're very excited about right now. Um, it's in the diversity and inclusion space. And they've had like five Fortune 500 companies come to them and say, I want to buy your product. You know, great problem to have. But we only need two, right, to get to that next round. And so we're like, okay, now which two do you pick? Or maybe you pick three because one might fall out, that sort of thing. We're like, no, 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 we want to do all five. And, you know, I mean, as you say, it's like we didn't, we didn't say no because we don't think that's appropriate. But, you know, we sort of tried to give them the cautions. So they've signed up all five, and now they've blown the first one. 
because their, their resources are so, th and I mean, their, their product is not fully baked yet, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of support that needs to go on to make sure that this enterprise product really gets rolled out. And they just didn't give it the first customer the attention that they need. And the first cu customer is like, still love the idea, come back in six months when you're more, f more fully baked. Yeah, well, I, I can, that's a good point that uh, people do get excited about an idea, but if it doesn't pan out the way that they envision it, then it's going to be very difficult to get them back. Like, have you know? Have you ever had a situation where you bought a company's product, the product burns you? You know, like a major, you know, like a major product, like a, maybe a Microsoft product or something like that. You got burned by the product, <laughs> and how is Microsoft going to sell you on another product or somebody else? Uh, specifically, calling out Microsoft, they use plenty of their products, but I have been burned by one of their products, and I'm, you know, very, very I step with trepidation of going into their other products. Let, I want to go back to the, the, the issue of running out of money because it's a really common problem and I would assume that's a big, big challenge for VCs. Do they all do this? Do they all burn faster than they expect and why does this happen? Uh, things take longer and cost more than you ever expect. <laughs> um, that's just, a, I think that's a, a mantra of life. <laughs> so you should just expect that and, uh, and be a little bit more conservative on how you're going to use your cash and how you're going to roll things out. Um. Well, and along those lines, I actually think the, the sooner you're able to identify that you're going to have a cash problem, the more levers you've got. So for example, if you identify you've got a cash problem and you've got a month of cash in the bank, you know, I mean, you're in real trouble. Whereas if sort of you know, six months from now, you can see that it might be you might not quite make your milestones and don't have enough time to raise your next round. Now you can do things like, okay, we're going to cut back on the contractor, or the founders are going to take less in terms of salary, but we're going to like buy ourselves some more runway. Um, you know, and but you know that that takes some forth foresight. They have to be like paying attention to this, and it also takes some I'd say um, intellectual honesty in the sense of, okay, where are you really in terms of your milestones and how does that stack up against your cash burn? Yeah. Uh, sure, of course. <clears throat> I had a startup in uh, Ireland and London and uh, failed at getting venture ultimately. Uh, I always thought in my imagination that uh, once I got the venture, everything would be good. <laughs> it was sort of like I'd been working for it for five years and um, and of course, now that I'm here, a resident of Silicon Valley for seven years, I know that's not the truth, uh, that in fact that's the start of a whole lot of new set of problems. And I wondered if each of you could um, just give a bullet points of the things you see a venture-backed startup has to face, the challenges they have to face once they get venture. Ah, expectations is number one. So now you have raised money based on a plan and obviously the or investors are going to be looking for you to accomplish that plan uh, or come up with an alternate based on data that you're getting in the marketplace on a different uh, approach. But um, it is, there is intense expectations on you accomplishing things. And in some ways you may not have the luxury of time that you might have before you took that money because you can diddle around a lot figuring things out Whereas, you know, T0, once T0 is hit and you're now on the clock, you have uh, a certain time that you're pacing yourself to that are expectations within the venture fund themselves. I would say, like, are you building a sustainable business, right? I think every startup founder should ask themselves that because you can't just burn VC's money forever. Um, and we were joking that a lot of the great customer service by a startup is actually funded by <laughs> people like us who give them a lot of money to burn so that they can earn that traction. Um, but I think th really think about the unit economics because if you're not able to sus like sustain the business on your own, then I think that's a bad sign. Um, so as you were saying, right, they should find customers first and then find some money would be, you know, that would be much easier. For, for our companies, it's the same thing. If they are, you know, a sustainable company on their own, VCs want to fund your business the most when you don't really need their money. So it's, I think the survival ability is, is very crucial. And I, I guess I'd say one of the I guess, 
expectations of entrepreneurs, I think that's off sometimes. As they say, you know, I've got, you know, I've got myself where I've got a couple of pilot customers and so forth. So I get some VC money. Now I'm going to go hire a VP of sales, and sales is going to take care of itself. And from my experience, it's like those first, I don't know, there's, there's like some period of time where, frankly, only you as an entrepreneur can sell the product. It's like, because a, like a salesperson, typical salesperson essentially needs a playbook. And they say, I will follow the playbook. You tell me who to talk to and what to say, and I can go do that 100 times. But if you don't have the playbook, a salesperson, the, the average salesperson, and even a great salesperson is going to have a really difficult time. And so, so that period of time, and we're, we're seed investors, so very rarely has somebody figured out the sales model. And so in between when we invest and when like the next big chunk of capital comes in, a lot of this is, okay, you as the entrepreneur are going to be on the front lines talking to customers. How do you make that successful? And that's a hard learning curve. And having extra capital from a venture capitalist doesn't make it any easier. And not just sales, but product market fit, right? Only an entrepreneur is going to figure that out. Your sales guy is going to have a filter on it that you're not going to have the real data coming through. Also, as your company scales, right, I think it's a big challenge for the founder to adapt to the bigger and bigger market and tougher and tougher requirements for the founder to can, you know, really take control of the market. So I think the having mental breakthroughs and having, you know, mental health is very important because sometimes if the founder collapses, then this company is, you know, going downhill. So. Sure. Actually, do me a favor. Be on mic when you say that. So a little bit of a follow-up question regarding um, sales, I guess, and scaling. Um, so how do you all look at, uh, you know, a company that you're looking at that is sort of saying, well, we're trying to decide whether we should basically sort of accept a bunch of money and hire up a, spin up a sales organization, uh, or potentially go a little bit longer, um, you know, kind of doing the entrepreneur sales, and then maybe actually leveraging channel partners instead, right? So a kind of a build it in-house versus rely on, and different markets have different requirements. On so some markets, actually, that, that's potentially beneficial. But I'm just wondering how you think about uh, basically spinning up your own sales organization versus going through and, channel partners. And, and let me just add to that question, which is very good. What are the signs that, uh, say, uh, cause you to make one decision over the other? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so our preference is uh, not to go too early into indirect channels because you're not getting, again, the r real data from the market. And so we actually would veer on staying direct as long as you can, as long as it's, um, as the cost of sales suggests that you can do that. Um, so we would have a predilection towards doing that. We would actually not put as much cash in the bank because we tend to see um, that entrepreneurs will if they think they've got it, they'll start burning right away, increasing and scaling. And in fact, they probably haven't gotten it on the first time. Um, so it's probably going to take two or three times before it's figured out. And so if you can do that in a more careful manner, in a direct conversation with the customers rather than through filters, we think we see much greater success with that model uh, than the alternative. Yeah. So, I, so I'd echo that too. So I, I'm very skeptical at the early stage of indirect channels, and in part because even success can, and by the way, this is the enterprise context, right? So we're talking direct salespeople a lot of times. Success looks like you've got a partnership with somebody, but now you have to get their salespeople trained up and motivated and this sort of thing. And then it's going to work into their compensation scheme. And, you know, like success could be between when you start the conversation with a direct channel and they say, oh, this is exciting. It can be a year before you get any cash out of that. All right? So that's a long time horizon when you're an early startup company. Uh, the other thing I'd say about um, I'm also a big fan of the entrepreneurs, like doing those, not only just the first couple sales, but really I would call it the representative sales. So usually those first few sales, especially if you come out of the industry and you know people and have domain expertise, those first couple of customers are usually a story. Well, I worked with, you know, Beth for a couple of years over here, and so she's willing to take a chance on you in a way that, you know, most companies wouldn't. So, so those, I mean, it's, it's good for validating that there's a real market opportunity out there, but it's not that good for validating the sales process. So once you've got a couple of, I call it representative customers where, you know, you didn't know them before and you somehow had a lead gen process and so forth and so on, now you're to the point where you can start to scale the sales process. You know, me, add, if you don't mind, to, to that, I couldn't, couldn't agree more with that last comment. 
I was, when I had started my company 10 years ago, uh, I was talking to essentially a mentor of mine, and I remember complaining that I wasn't getting the money that I expected from certain customers, and he said, oh, geez, starting out, don't worry about the money at all. Just get the stories. All, and he could not have been more right because after I got my first two, three stories, which validated the work that we were doing, mm -hmm. and also we, we had some big, you know, big blue chip clients, that just dropping those names and telling the stories, that got us everything else, mm -hmm. and at the rate that we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Also, as a CEO, I think your most important job is to sell. You need to sell so that you can hire the best people. You need to sell so that you can sell your products and services. And you need to sell so that you don't, you know, your company doesn't run out of money. So I think, especially at the early stage, the CEO really has great responsibilities to go out there. And when you choose a channel partner, I think it's important to see whether your interests and motivations are aligned because Otherwise, I think it's, it's much better to do it yourself. And on, co on the consumer end, a lot of our um, startup companies, they do both, right? So they have direct channels via their digital platform, and they also have distribution partners. And for them, I think it's really, they're, they're sacrificing a little bit of the margins to get more exposure. And it's really important that they choose the right partners that could showcase them in the right light. We oh, we got a question back there? Yep. Hold on. And feel free to turn and look at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> One of the challenges for the seed investors, especially working with a very large um, uh, strategic investors with them, you know, who wants to do for a strategic reason, but they end up doing this seed round. So you have a strategic investor that has done a seed round in your company. Wow, that's tough. Yeah, that's really tough because <laughs> what, what their objectives may not necessarily align with what your objectives are. And, um, and so that is either going to work out really bad or probably really, well, maybe you'll get lucky. I don't know. Have you ever had that well, well, successfully? Yeah. Right, well, so, so, so I th it's interesting. So, so this year I've had two of my deals where a strategic partner has shown up, um, which is pretty At unusual. the seed stage. At the seed stage, yeah. Mm. And, and, and in both cases, they totally messed up the pricing from my point of view. Okay. And, and, and the way they came in is, you know, they see strategic, it was, it was a combination. We're going to invest in your company and we want to do a commercial deal. And so really they're getting a lot of value out of that commercial deal. I, I don't have a commercial deal with these folks. I'm just a, a straightly a straight financial investor, if you will. And so, you know, it creates a real tension, if you will, because basically what I said in both cases, the entrepreneur, it's like, you know, Love what you're doing, love to invest, but you know, here's the price at which I'm willing to come in at. And you know, I know the strategic is willing to come in, frankly, with a larger check and at a higher price. And so, you know, we've got a gap here. If we can figure out a way to resolve it, you know, great. And basically in one case we did, and in one case I didn't. So Yeah. But you know, if you have a case where you have a, a strategic that wants to do a business deal and invest get the business deal done first, right. because oftentimes what I see is they invest and then they never get around to getting the business deal done and then you've got someone who may or may not be behind you in ultimately helping your company succeed. Yeah, but some of the markets are really tough to get entry. Oh yeah, so oh yeah. Well, but, especially the automotive is in one of the biggest markets. Right. So, yeah. so, so I'd say, you know, well, for, well first of all, you do what you gotta do, right? I mean, if you need capital and that's the source of capital, you take it. But I'd say, you know, it, you're, you're now on a path where your most likely investor at that next stage is going to be that same strategic or another strategic. Because you're, you're kind of in a realm where there's a different set of issues that are becoming, if you will, the priority as opposed to the issues that a venture capitalist might view. So it doesn't rule it out, but it does create friction in the system for somebody like myself for, to show up. I think. Well, to, to, be, to be investing first and then have them come in later. That would make it easier. Right. <laughs> or, or cut a business deal where there's a structure that allows you to take money and they get rewarded on warrants or something along those lines based on revenue that they generate for the company, not just yeah, investment that, dollars. That. Do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I've seen cases where a strategic corporate would come in as both an investor and a first customer, right? And so that generates a lot of value and other investors could be happy about it too. But in other cases where the strategics want to invest very early on, 
And if this is a marketplace type of company who are going to work with a lot of other companies in the future, then this could really ruin their chances, especially when it comes to acquisition much later on. And I also think corporates, a lot of the times, their interests don't align with uh, VCs or with the startups. So usually they have their own agenda, <laughs> so you have to be a little careful. Um, also having a corporate strategic in the round sometimes raises the prices a lot because corporate strategics are sometimes they're not driven by financial returns so um, they're like less sophisticated in that sense so they don't care paying a little more but I think that's actually bad for the other you know VCs um, well the bigger issue is corporates you know you're you're a gnat on their business model you're not the big thing that's going to swing their business model. Don't you know, take that company. personally. And, <laughs> and so, um, so they may change their mind in six months when they do replanning and reorg and all that stuff. And that just happens all the time with these big corporates. And so y you've taken money and from somebody who really doesn't care anymore because you're not on their strategic roadmap anymore. That's, that's kind of difficult to manage that process. All right, we only have about five minutes left. Am I correct? Only five minutes? So uh, here's what I, I want to sort of close the discussion and one one thing that I also want to address that that you said so let me I'm gonna ask this question first and then I'm gonna have a closing question so we'll try to get to both of these we'll, I'll see what we can do we'll see what we pull off they'll also be available you'll be available afterwards right we're gonna yeah, lock we'll the doors around. you're not leaving um, so it's an issue that you brought up Susan is yeah. about and I don't think and I thought what you brought up was very interesting about preparing for the downturn the inevitable downturn. It's interesting. I, I, I've done a lot of work in commercial real estate, specifically here in California, which I don't know if you noticed, it doesn't seem that they're going to be a downturn. But what I've learned from people in real estate, <laughs> there's always a downturn, always a downturn. So it's going to happen. It just doesn't look like it's happening right now. Um, so why should I prepare for that? What's right. the point of that? Right. I was having lunch with two VCs today, and they were going, damn, we really thought it was going to be this year. And so we started buckling down and getting companies ready. And so it's going to come. We just don't know when. And the guys that are burning hot, that are throwing cash out, their reckoning will come. So I think as, you're, as you run your companies, you need to always be thinking about, OK, and it's typically an event that causes it, right? Some event, global event, we know we have plenty to choose from, is what are you going to do when that happens? How do you, you know, buckle down and go? I mean, when uh, Mike Moritz sent out that PowerPoint slide deck in 2001 in the fall, and that just went like wildfire through the valley. And everybody started laying off and shutting down and pulling in to get ready for that and be able to survive. So I think always founders should always have a plan B so that when it happens, that they they know exactly what they're going to react with rather than trying to do it in the moment. Well, and, and just to build on it, what it looks like from an enterprise sales company point of view, when the downturn happens, all of a sudden your sales pipeline dries up. You had all these folks that were about to sign and they've said, no, no, we got to wait to see what happens. Right? So, so, so that's where the pinch point comes. Right. So the more self-reliant your company is, the, more, the better you could go through a t difficult time, right? So what I found with investing in women is that they are really, really resilient. And they use capital very efficiently. So they rarely run out of cash. And, <laughs> and they build sustainable businesses. So you know, even if there is hardship, I think they can survive with cash on the bank and cash in the bank and the revenue that's coming in. Um, so I think just you know, plan ahead. And capital winters, as we call it, come as they please. So <laughs> um, yeah, just be ready for it. All right, I'm going to close with this question. If we have a moment, we'll get to you. But be prepared to just chat with them afterwards because, yes, we only have a few minutes. All right, I want quick answers from all three of you on this. And this just is, what is the one thing a startup could show you that you're like, ah, I don't have to worry as much with these people. I want to work with them. What, what would they have to show you to make you, make you feel comfortable and not have to worry as much? If they have the ability to just grow without much, you know, external push, I think that's a great sign. So for our first company that we invested with a fund called Function of Beauty, we were kind of on the fence because for us as a seed fund, their valuation was already very high. So I was watching them on social media for a very long time. <laughs> and every day there were people just 
posting about it and they were definitely not paid because they only had like a few followers but people were just posting about it and posting about it all day long and when you search for the hashtag every day there are more people doing free marketing for the brand and you're like what is going on and some youtuber is doing reviews for them and has over a million views and function is not paying them to do it so when you have that kind of traction happens you're like shit like they're building momentum and they are you know they're like Customer acquisition cost is very high and it has real potential to go viral. Mm -hmm. And it's very low. It's very low, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they're like really on an autopilot and we don't worry about them really. So that's like a great example of what you could do could make to make your investors really so happy. All you have to do is have a video that has over a million views. Simple as that. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> the number of times we, we produce a lot of videos and, and it, this doesn't happen anymore, but the, the number of times we've had a client come to us and say, we want you to make a viral video, to which I always say, so you want us to make Star Wars? Is that what you want us to do? Yeah, we can do that for you. You want us to make an Oscar-winning movie? All right. Uh, what uh, uh, what, what, so what yeah. would they, I'll just do, set you up again. What could a startup, a, a founder do, say to you to make you feel comfortable so you can stress less? Yeah. So for our business model, which is around capital efficient startups, is demonstrating that you can scale capital efficiently so that your unit economics work out and you understand how to build a company that's self-sustaining that can reach profitability in a very capital efficient way. And, and so for me, for me I'd say um, an entrepreneur that just really deeply understands their customer and that just shows through. So for example, like one customer or one entrepreneur will basically, it's like, well, I'm not sure they're gonna buy, but they keep calling me up and asking me questions about how they should run their business in these other areas. And it's like, okay, you're in a position where you'll figure this out. Awesome. All right. We're going to wrap this up here. Please chat with them afterwards. Let me a big round of applause for everyone up here. Clint Corver, Susan. <laughs>